good afternoon and welcome to the session on reasoning techniques. Um, it's now two o'clock, so we can start the session. Our first speaker is uh, Graham Smith, and he's going to talk us about value-dependent information um, on weak memory models. Okay, thank you. So as, as the title suggests, this talk is about information flow, and it's about information flow on weak memory models. Um, the sort of weak memory models that I'm interested in aren't software weak memory models that some people talk about, so not things like C11, which allow for compiler optimizations, but hardware weak memory models. And this is where the actual processors themselves can optimize the code that's executing on them. And all multi-core processors these days um, have weak memory models. So some of the features of these weak memory models are things like, um, for example, in Intel, which uses a very simple memory model called TSO, they have something called store buffering. And what store buffering is, is basically um, when the program is going to do a write to global memory, this uses, the res uses resources. So there might be contention for global memory at that time. So it's more efficient not to do the write straight away, but to allow the hardware to decide when that write should occur. So what happens is that the program executes the store or the write to global memory, and that write actually goes into a, what's called a store buffer. So it's buffered, and it gets then um, flushed to the main memory at some time later that the hardware decides on. And so obviously this can cause different cores in the system. So you have core A has done a write to X, core B has done a write to X, but both cores haven't seen each other's writes yet. And so you can get um, the cores um, operating out of sync, but this is only in, only in the case where you have data races. So basically these weak memory models are designed so that if you don't have data races in your code, you don't have concurrency or data races in your code, everything should work as you expect. But if you have data races, then you may get some unexpected behaviors sometimes. So another example of what weak memory models do is speculative execution. And this is where you come to a branch in your code, and it may take some time to evaluate whether the branch condition is true or false. So rather than wait, what the um, processor may do is to go ahead and speculate which branch is the one we're going to take and actually do some of the instructions in the branch before the branch condition has been evaluated. Of course, if the branch condition is evaluated to be um, false and we've gone down the wrong branch, then we may have to roll back. Um, instruction pipelining is something that's also used quite often. And the idea here is that you have one instruction running. That instruction needs to do a memory access, which is going to take time. It's expensive. And so the processor starts another instruction executing ahead of it. And in some memory models, such as those of ARM and IBM Power, um, the instructions can actually be committed to memory out of order. So you get, you know, your first instruction is still, is still in the pipeline. The second one has totally finished, and it gets committed to memory before the other. And once again, this has what unusual effects and what's often called is out of order execution. So for example, in a memory model like ARM, you may have a program on one thread that assigns one to X, followed by assigning two to Y. But if the hardware actually commits the second assignment first to memory, the other threads in the system see Y is assigned two followed by X is assigned one. Now obviously if there's a data race in the system on X and Y, then this is going to cause um, unexpected behavior. So for a long time now, it's been known that if we're to verify um, racy code on weak memory models, we need to take into effect these sorts of accounts. But there's very little work that's been done on information flow. And so in this work, we've started to look at what effects can these reorderings have on information flow. And in particular, we're focusing in this paper on the memory model of ARMv8. So ARMv8 is the most recent version of the ARM processor. And for those of you don't, who don't know about ARM, ARM is um, basically the processor that most of you have in your mobile phones or in your iPads and things like that. So most mobile devices use ARM processors these days. And um, it's been in the news recently that Apple are switching from Intel to ARM next year. So ARM is a processor that's um, quite commonly used. Now, last year's FM, uh, Robert Colvin and I presented a semantics of weak memory models, an operational semantics. And in particular, one of the um, memory models we considered was the ARMv8. And just to give you an idea of the sorts of reorderings that can go on, 
Um, this is, these are the rules here for reordering of assignments on ARMv8. Now, we can't just reorder any assignments. So if we want to be able to reorder, well, if the reordering of X is assigned E with Y is assigned F, where Y is assigned F is coming after X is assigned E, if that reordering is, will only be possible when all these conditions hold. So the first one is just saying that X and Y are distinct variables. So obviously if you have a program that assigns one to X followed by assigning two to X, swapping the order of those two instructions doesn't make sense because that single thread will lose its um, functionality that was intended by the programmer. So the idea is that on a single thread, the functionality should still be the same. But if we had X is assigned one followed by Y is assigned two, then swapping those two instructions is okay because the functionality will still be the same. We'll still end up in a final state where X has value one and Y has value two. So there are other rules as well. So for instance, um, X should not be free in F, the expression we're assigning to Y. And there's some side condition there because there are special cases. We, we do allow this. Um, I won't go into the details of why that is. Um, also, y should not be free in E, so this variable y should not be free in the expression that we're assigning to x. And finally, E and F should not share any global variables, so they should not have any global variables in common. Now, basically what we can see from these four rules is that if we have expression x is assigned E and y is assigned F, and these two assignments don't share any common variables at all, then we should be able to reorder them. Okay? So if there's nothing in common in the two assignments, reordering is possible under the ARM semantics. So how does this affect security? So here's a very simple program um, to motivate this. So in this program, X is a variable that can hold classified information only when C is odd. Okay, so X is gonna be some sort of variable that's shared between perhaps computers working in different security domains. It might be a buffer that both um, computers are sharing and sometimes it's allowed to hold classified information and sometimes it's not. And whether it's allowed to or not will be, will be controlled by some trusted um, computing base, sort of the type of thing that um, June was speaking about this morning. So in this trusted computing base, we may have um, a little program like this. This is, once again, very simple, but illustrates what I want to um, explain in this talk. So what's happening here is we have C is initially zero and X is initially zero. Because C is zero, C is even, and so therefore we shouldn't be able to put classified information into the variable x. But here we increment c by one, so c becomes odd, and so therefore now it's allowed to put the secret information into x, okay? But before we make c even again down here, we need to make sure we clear any secret information from x, because when c is even, any, any thread will be able to read the value of x. When c is odd, only those privileged threads will be able to read it. So we need to make sure that c gets changed to odd before we put secret information into X and gets changed to even, um, oh well, that X gets its secret information removed before we change C back to even. So that's what the program's doing. Now if we think back to what I said about reordering and look at these first two instructions, they actually have nothing in common. This one only refers to C, this one refers to X and some secret value, but there's no common variables in there that would cause a dependency to say that those instructions can't be reordered. So in fact, this program can be reordered um, under the ARM memory model such that this assignment comes before this one. Obviously, this leads to a memory leak because now we have X's secret before C becomes odd. So C is even originally, we make X secret, any thread can now read the secret from X. That's a bad thing. Also, if we look at the last two lines of code, once again, there's no dependencies between them, so they could be reordered like this. And in this case, we make C um, even at this point, but X still holds the secret. So between these two lines of code, another thread could come in and read the secret that's in X. So these are the sort of things that we want to detect. In this very simple example, it doesn't take much um, reasoning to see what's going on and realize that we need to prevent these reorderings, but in more complicated code, these things might be hard to see. So what we do is we We've developed an information flow logic to help us reason about code and to find um, these leaks in the code. So what is an information flow logic? So this is a very simple information flow logic that would be used in um, a non-weak memory model setting. So what we have is a lattice of security um, levels 
where low means unclassified or public information and high means classified or secret information. And, we, and that's the lattice, so high is obviously greater than low in that lattice. We have a context gamma, which keeps track for every variable whether it's holding low or high information. So this is a value that's being held in the variable um, at that time. And we also have this um, L function, which for every variable gives us its classification. So the classification of a variable is the maximum um, level of information that it can hold. So for instance, if a variable was classified as high, it could hold high information or low information. If it was classified as low, it's only allowed to hold low information. And from these things, we can then develop rules for each um, instruction in our language. So we step through the program one instruction at a time, try and apply the rule that's um, required for that instruction. If the rule goes through, OK, that is, means if the premises hold, then we know there's no information leak. If the rule fails, then there's an information leak and we need to investigate what's wrong. So this is a simple rule for assignment. What's happening here is, first of all, from the context, we evaluate the expression E to give its security type to find out whether it's high or low. And then we check that that security type is actually within what's allowed for the variable X. If it is, we can then assign E to X, okay? So if this evaluated to high, but LX was low, then this thing would be false, and that's where we detect that there's a security problem. Also, the rule updates the context by now assigning X to T, which means we can move on to the next line of code and our context has been updated with what the program's done so far. Now, for the program I showed you before, it required this value-dependent classification which means um, the value, the classification of X was dependent on the variable C. So to model that sort of, um, an information flow logic that can handle that sort of program, this, these two things are the same up here, gamma and the um, lattice of low and high values, but now our function L maps variables to predicates rather than just to a single low or high value. And that predicate will evaluate to true when the classification is low. So we take a look at this predicate in the current state. If it evaluates to true, we know that the variable is low at that point. If it evaluates to false, we know that the variable has a high classification. And so our assignment rule becomes a little more complicated because now we have this, um, this extra context um, variable P, which is a predicate on the current state. And so when we evaluate an expression, we need to take into account both gamma and P and when, what we also need to do is um, check this condition over here. So either from P, the current state, we can deduce not LX, which means LX um, is false and our classification is high. In that case, anything can get put into X. Otherwise, we need to put low in, low in uh, T needs to be low because for this to, um, for E to be allowed to be put into X. Okay, so that's the condition now that's checking whether this expression E is allowed to be signed, assigned to X without causing um, an information flow problem. And once again, we update gamma and P. So this logic was actually developed by one of my co-authors, Toby Murray, um, a few years ago. And what the um, challenge was with this work was to make this work for weak memory models. Because what's happening with these rules, as I said, these rules are, are being applied in order to um, our code and we're updating gamma and p at each point in time. But if instructions can be reordered, how do we know that the instructions that occur earlier in the code have actually really occurred? Um, so they appear in the code earlier, but they may not have actually been committed, and so this predicate p and this gamma may actually be out of sync with what's actually happening in the execution. So the problem is basically that gamma and p ignore that instructions can be reordered in the program. So what we did to overcome this problem was to keep track of which things we know have definitely occurred. So which parts of the ordering are definitely, um, uh, have definitely taken place. So in other words, we introduced this variable w, and for each variable, what we want to know is which variables, other variables, values we can rely on as having taken effect. So for example, um, wx will be all those variables, so wx means the next time we write to a variable x in the code, anything that's in the set wx, we can be assured 
the assignments occurring in the code earlier than this right to X have actually really occurred. It's a bit of a complicated concept, so I'll try and explain it with a couple of examples. So here's three lines of code. So Z gets assigned to W, Y gets assigned to Z, and then X gets assigned to Y. Now what happens here is in the first two lines of code, we have a dependency. The Z appears here and Z appears here. So those two lines of code cannot be reordered according to our ru rules of ARMv8. So therefore, um, at this point in the code, we know that if we do a write to Y, which we're actually doing, then we can assume that all previous writes to Z have really occurred. So that when we do this write to Y, we know that Z has the value W, which might be important in determining the security level of Y, because it may depend on Z. Similarly, when we do the write to X, because of the dependency between the two Ys here, we know that this write to Y must have occurred, so WX includes this Y. And further all, furthermore, because we know that when this write occurs, any writes to Z have occurred, we can also deduce by transitivity that Z also must be in this set WX. So we build up these sets as we step through the program to work out which instructions um, we can rely on as having definitely occurred before we reach the instruction we're trying to evaluate. Now these sets, as you can see here, they can get larger, they can also get smaller. So here's an example where we lose something from the set. So in this case, at the beginning, um, because of the Z here in this second assignment, we know these two can't be reordered. So therefore, WX includes Z at this point because we know the Z assignment has definitely occurred. But when we move down to here, and we assign Z to zero, then we have to remove Z from the set. And the reason for that is because at the next write to X, we can't assume at this point that this instruction has occurred, that Z has a value zero, because in fact these two instructions can be reordered. So it turns out that whenever we don't use a value like X in the expression that we're assigning to another variable, then that variable has to be removed from the set WX. Okay. So what does this look like um, for our rules? Well, simply what we do is the premises we had in our assignment rule need to be slightly changed. Um, before we had gamma and P were used to determine the security type of our expression, but now we have to restrict T to those variables that are in WX because those variables are the ones we know definitely have the values that are in P and any other variables that aren't in WX, we don't know if the assignments to them have taken place or not, so we can't assume um, anything that P says about them. Similarly, when we're deducing whether our assignment can take place, um, we need to use P restricted to WX in the same sort of fashion. Yes? Yes. Yes, it's a, a good question, and my next slide should explain that to you. <laughs> so this is the example again. So this is my example from before, um, slightly changed. So I've, I've written a, real, a small program here. So C and X are assigned to zero initially, and then I have some loop that's essentially doing what I had before, but what I've done now is add a fence in between the two instructions I didn't want to reorder. So a fence is basically an, an instruction that's going to ensure that those lines can't be reordered. It adds an extra dependency um, that we, we, we can't reorder across. So um, in this program, our L of X is just that C is even. So whenever C is even, we know that X has a low value. When C is odd, X can have a high value and therefore we can put um, a secret value into it. Now, if we um, step through this program and calculate the W set as we go, by the time we get to this point here, um, because there's been no dependencies between any of the assignments, what we get is that for any writes to C, such as this one, we can only depend on the previous write to C having occurred. And for any writes to X, we can only depend on the previous write to X having occurred at this point in the program. So when we do this assignment here to C, C doesn't require anything um, in terms of the value of X, so this assignment will, will pass our rule and everything's fine. Then we get to the fence. And what the fence does is prevent any reordering. So now C will map to all variables and so will X, which means the next time we, we do a write to C, we can actually um, depend on all the writes to C and X that have already occurred in the program. 
namely that they're zero at this point. And similarly, when we, we do a write to x, which we do here, we can depend on all the writes of c and x having occurred. So from that, when we get to this line here, we can deduce that um, we still have this holding here. So we can deduce that c is actually going to be an um, odd number because it started at zero, we've incremented it once here. If we've gone around this loop a few times, it's always becoming even at the end, and so it will always be odd here. And so because x can depend on the latest value of c having occurred, we know that c is odd, therefore we know that x is allowed to hold a high value, and therefore this is fine to do. If we didn't have the fence, then um, the situation would be slightly different, because the fence was the thing that added in these extra variables into our w sets, if we didn't have them, then x would only be, still be able to depend on the fact that x is zero, but not anything about c at all. So we couldn't deduce anything about c here, therefore we don't know that x is allowed to hold a high value at this point, and therefore we've detected the leak that I showed before, which is due to these two lines being reordered. And similarly for the, um, the other reordering possibility down the bottom, because we have the fence here, we know that c and x can depend on all previous assignments having taken place. And then we can increment C and everything's fine. But there's some slight difference here. So in this case, if we remove the fence, our rule still passes. Because C doesn't depend on X at all. So the fact that C doesn't know the value of X is not going to make this rule fail. And so when we discovered this, we thought, OK, we need something else in our logic to take care of that. And what we need is, well, sorry, just going back to this example, what's happening here is the classification of x is falling from high to low at this point. And when that happens, we need to know that x is definitely has a low value. We don't want this classification to fall from high to low when x still has a high value, which could happen if these two things were reordered. So we introduced yet another condition to our assignment rule, which basically says that if x's classification falls from high to low, then the latest write to x must definitely have occurred according to c's perspective. So in wc, x must be there. And furthermore, gamma x, which is recording the um, security level of x's value, it must be low. So we're saying x must be low, and this has definitely occurred at this point. So that got rid of that problem. But then it also introduced a new thing to think about. This is looking at when the classification falls from high to low, what about when the classification goes from low to high? Is that going to cause any problems? And it turns out we found an example where it does, this very simple example here. So in this example, x is low when c equals zero. So if we have c equals c is assigned zero in a fence, then at this point of the program, x is definitely low. And we can assign it to this variable r, which is always low. OK, so we can put the low value of x into the low variable r. But then we have this thing here which makes um, x become a high value because we set c to 1. Now, if these two things get reordered, which they can, we get a problem again because what's happening here is we, we set c to 1, x's value has risen from low to high, its classification has risen from low to high, and another thread can step in at this point here and actually assign a high value to the variable x, and then that high value will be assigned to the variable r, which shouldn't be done. So we get another problem, and the way to get around that problem was to introduce a set like w, but um, this one is to do with reads rather than writes. So the idea is that the next time we read a variable, sorry, so the, let me rephrase that. Um, it's the next time we write a particular variable, say c, we need to be sure that all the reads to these variables have um, taken effect. And there's a simple um, extra condition we need to add to our assignment rule to, to take account of this. And it basically says that if X class, X's classification rises from low to high due to some assignment to C, then all the, well, the most recent read to X must have occurred um, before this assignment to C. And at this point of the development of this logic, obviously these things are getting very subtle and it's very hard to see have we covered all possibilities. So what we did was to encode our logic in Isabel Hole and Nicholas Coughlin, who's the second author on the paper, 
spent several months um, proving non-interference, which is a standard um, condition for information flow. And we have now a proof of soundness of our logic, which is online, um, available for anyone who wants to look at it. So basically, what have we done? We've introduced an information flow logic for ARM v8, which um, hasn't been done before. And in particular, this works for value-dependent security classifications, which seem to introduce problems um, in, in weak memory models that we may not um, have otherwise expected. It's, our logic has been proved sound, and our ongoing work is basically to extend the logic to cover a fuller, um, basically get a fuller coverage of the ARM um, instruction set. We're working on rely guarantee reasoning so that we can do things thread locally in the logic, and we have started to look at building tool support using symbolic execution and automated theorem proving. Thank you. Questions? Thank you very much for this nice talk. Um, I am wondering, have you considered extending this to other synchronization primitives than, uh, than fences? Or maybe you already have, yeah, but okay. you didn't say it. No, OK. So the logic we've presented in the paper only had full fences. And obviously, in ARM and other weak memory models, there are lots of different types of things. There's um, store fences and load fences. There's control fences that prevent speculative execution, et cetera. And we're in the process um, of doing that at the moment. So that first point there, fuller coverage of ARM v8 ISA, mm. refers to those sorts of things. So far, we've, we've managed to add all of the ARM um, fences into the logic, but they don't appear in the papers published at the moment. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Yep. Very impressive also with the formalization. Thank you. Yeah, thanks also for the nice presentation. Um, would it be very difficult to add decision procedures to fix uh, programs that uh, break the, the non-interference? Sorry, I didn't understand. A de decision procedure to uh, fix programs breaking the non-interference. Okay, so what, what, our, what the purpose of what we're doing is, is to actually find the points where um, the information leakage is happening and what our logic will do is that it, it's stepping through the code one line at a time, using symbolic execution in our tool, for example. And when it gets to a line where information leak occurs, it will flag that line as, as a problem. What we have to do then is investigate that and find out what the problem is and generally work out, do we need a fence or something to stop reordering that's causing the problem? So we don't have any way of automatically fixing problems, but it's, um, it's, it's basically a tool to enable us to find the problems to start with. Thanks. OK, any more questions? OK, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, our second presentation is going to be delivered by Martin Strecker and it's on reasoning formally about databa database queries and updates. Yes, so thank you. Uh, so, uh, well, first of all, why did we get interested in database queries and updates? So, in principle, the people involved in this project uh, are rather from the programming language community and, um, well, we, uh, we're working on graph transformations and uh, uh, so graph transformations somehow as abstractions of what is going on in a heap uh, when you have um, pointer manipulating programs. And well, as you all know, there's a huge amount of work on heap manipulating programs and uh, lots of static analyses and specialized logics such as separation logic. 
And um, they, are, they have been conceived for, uh, well, uh, defining uh, and uh, reasoning about uh, sophisticated data structures. So you, you uh, have, uh, well, shape analyses, which uh, somehow characterize the shape of uh, complex, uh, let's say, uh, tree data structures where the leaves are uh, linked by pointers and so forth, yes? Um, and uh, programs can manipulate pointers just by moving one pointer from, from one node to another node, for example. And uh, our aim was, well, to reason about this kind of manipulation more abstractly um, via graph transformations. The problem uh, with all these approaches is that uh, they are either not precise enough or they, uh, well, require strong human intervention because uh, they are not entirely automatable or they have uh, undecidable uh, inference problems, yes. So uh, there's a lot of work on this, but uh, it, it's somehow uh, unsatisfactory. On, and uh, well, what we try to do, are there, or what we were looking at, are there application areas where we can uh, reason about, let's say, graph transformations uh, uh, and be useful and, uh, well, uh, avoid those pitfalls. Um, so we looked around and uh, in the context of databases we realized that there's a shift of paradigms that is going away from the traditional relational uh, uh, databases to graph databases. So, so where you have graphs which you uh, can manipulate. Uh, so you, you first, well, have uh, graphs uh, consisting of nodes and relations uh, and uh, uh, these are used, uh, for example, for uh, knowledge bases and uh, what you are interested in is to, to describe more in detail uh, the shapes occurring in these graphs. So you can have some kind of integrity constraints that you want to impose on those graphs. And uh, so I think that uh, the, the technology that we have developed for graph transformations can fruitfully, fruitfully be applied here. Um, what happens is also that uh, people use views to extract data from one database to map it into another database or to give a, a view uh, where you want to ensure that, uh, for example, certain data that are actually stored in your database are not visible to certain users. Yeah? So you do some kind of transformation or extraction of data from a database into another database schema. Um, so here you typically do not have the kind of sophisticated data structures that you uh, use in uh, traditional heap uh, manipulating uh, programming languages. And um, so uh, um, this is a uh, positive side. On the other hand, we uh, well have a community that is not really used to uh, formal methods and that probably uh, could not uh, well uh, uh, drive an, uh, an interactive proof assistant, for example, for carrying out any proofs. So what we would require here is uh, really to have automated proofs. Yeah? So all, the, all this uh, led us to the setup where we want to so, uh, somehow introduce formal methods into uh, database practice. Um, with a simple but uh, powerful uh, database query language and where we can also modify the database, yeah. Um, so when talking about databases here, we, we talk about graph databases. We uh, can somehow avoid using complex uh, data structures and uh, uh, we uh, can uh, impose semantic constraints on the shape of the data uh, with an expressive assertion formalism. And nevertheless, we can offer a well push button technology for, for our verification. Just to give you a taste of what uh, we are aiming at, we are aiming at well uh, writing uh, well combined queries and updates uh, that are structured like this. So you have uh, well matching constructs that correspond to queries. You see that we well. Uh, want to extract uh, data into uh, variable A, so store data into var variable A that uh, uh, satisfy this predicate here. Uh, then we add the data that we have stored in variable A 
to a relation C um, and uh, these match statements can be nested and uh, so uh, what is uh, written in black is uh, somehow the matching and uh, well query and update formalism and besides that we have pre and post conditions pre and post conditions that are written in blue uh, that uh, correspond to uh, well uh, traditional uh, pre and post conditions that you find in imperative programming languages yes so the application scenario here is well uh, described more in detail in the paper so we uh, have applicants that uh, apply for being uh, accepted for using a service and uh, an employee of a company first has to validate the applicant and uh, so um, the, uh, the clients that have been validated uh, or all clients have to be validated yes so that is what we assume and uh, so we also assume that all people who have an, uh, the uh, service activated um, are also subscribed to that service. So this is somehow an integrity constraint that we want to impose on the database. You see we uh, can use quantifiers in, in arbitrary nesting and so forth. And then while well, we, we carry out this program so we uh, fetch new applicants uh, that uh, have not had their uh, data processed for so far but uh, if, as soon as they have been validated by an employee so we can add them into the client database or the, the client relation and then uh, activate their subscription if they have been subscribed to uh, a service. And uh, then we finally delete the, uh, uh, the applicants from the applicant relation. So this is our scenario and well in the end we have uh, uh, this post condition. Um, so what I'll do in the following is, uh, well, get a little bit more into the details of this programming language, uh, then show how we can uh, calculate uh, weakest preconditions. So in, in a sense, the setup is uh, traditional, but uh, there are uh, nevertheless some peculiarities, uh, such as reasoning about, uh, well, sets of data instead of just a single uh, data. Um, and uh, what I'll show in the end is that uh, when we somehow weakly restrict our programming language and our assertion formalism, then uh, we can use a logic uh, that is known to be decidable. So um, what does our language look like? Well, you've already seen an example. We uh, have uh, traditional statements that uh, can be sequentialized. We have uh, uh, elementary statements that uh, allow to add uh, data stored in variables to a relation or to delete uh, variables uh, or data stored in, in a variable from a relation. So that uh, corresponds more or less to, uh, well, adding edges in a graph or deleting edges in a graph or just uh, uh, adding information to a single node. Yeah? So uh, these relations can be N array, so of an arbitrary array. Um, then the, the distinct or distinctive feature of our formalism is this match statement. So <laughs> where you retrieve data from a query and a, a query is just a formula that uh, contains uh, a vector of variable V free. So we uh, fetch all the variables that satisfy the formula then we continue uh, executing that statement. Our formulas are traditional first order formulas. For the time being, without any restriction, I'll tell you about uh, the guarded fragment later. And well, a program is just a, one statement with pre and post conditions. So, the, uh, so I've already alluded to the fact that we use a somehow non-standard semantics and the non-standard semantics consists of not just considering one single interpretation but to sort of consider several interpretations in parallel. So we have an individual semantics as we call it and a set-based uh, semantics that allows you to uh, manipulate uh, sets of values at the same time. Um, so. Uh, we can assume that at the start of our program we have a database which is just giving, given as 
well, a set of nodes or uh, elements that are in unary relations, and then you have arcs between uh, elements uh, which are in the binary relations, yes? So matching consists of assigning to our variable A, so the set of all the uh, uh, values of all the elements in our model that satisfy uh, this formula. And uh, when executing an add or a delete statement, well, we just add all the values occurring uh, or assigned to variable A to set C. Yeah? So uh, initially set C is composed of C1 and C2. And after adding uh, the values as, uh, assigned to A, we get uh, this new set. Similarly, uh, when uh, executing don't, uh, a match statement where uh, we have several variables. Well, uh, so we keep the assignments to the variables that have been matched before. So here the nesting comes into play. And then we add uh, new assignments to that variable S. Yeah? So, so we get um, n-tuples uh, uh, as a result of a match statement. And uh, then we can also add uh, so relations to existing relations. Um, so uh, this is a, a trace of an execution. Well, to make the semantics more precise, what do we use? So we use individual interpretations, which are the usual interpretations that you know from first-order logic. And uh, the set-based interpretation, well, uh, is also composed of a domain, of an interpretation of uh, relations, and a set of ind individual variables, individual variables like A and S. And um, so, uh, well, it's just a set of assignments of uh, values to variables. Yeah? And this is a, um, uh, so our set-based interpretation. And uh, well, we can uh, define a satisfiability relation just as saying, well, uh, a set-based interpretation satisfies a formula if for all the individual interpretations that occur in the set here, uh, the individual interpretation satisfies the formula, yes. So somehow we can reduce satisfiability um, uh, on, on a set as, or, uh, to individual uh, satisfiability. So we can show that a formula is valid under the individual semantics if and only if it is valid under the set-based semantics. Um, so this is the logic or our so, uh, extension of the logic as far as the semantics is concerned. And now we have a, an operational semantics for our programming language. Um, so let me just point out the match statement. All the other rules are somehow standard. So when we match uh, uh, so a formula for variables, uh, what do we do? Well, we compute the maximum model uh, that satisfies the formula. So this is an assignment of uh, variables to, or of values to the variables V here. And, um, under this maximal model, we carry out the operations in the body of the match statement. Uh, then we get uh, a new uh, state. And uh, well, uh, in order to somehow hide the, uh, the assignments made to variable v, well, we have to reset the, the uh, assignments to those variables v afterwards. Yeah? So uh, the, the variables v here are uh, defined locally in the uh, statement. So therefore, we have to reset variables. So this is the operational semantics. And um, so now uh, we just wonder how can we define uh, sort of a whole logic on the semantics. Um, well, uh, there's one uh, syntactic restriction that we have to introduce in advance in order to be able to carry out uh, this reasoning. So, so what is the idea? We will uh, traverse the program in our whole logic. And uh, each time that we want to uh, carry out an operation uh, that involves uh, variables like uh, the A here, we will look up in the local context how this, uh, these variables have been defined. So this uh, lowercase a has been defined here in a match statement. 
in order to be do that, we have to make sure that uh, this uh, variable a has not been redefined in a sense, and uh, also the the, the uh, uh, relation a capital A has not been redefined. Yeah. So uh, at this point, we would assume that. Uh, uh, what we can say or claim about A is that uh, capital A of small a uh, holds here, but this is not true because capital A has been redefined in between. This is something that we have to avoid, uh, and therefore we introduce a relation of uh, um, uh, stability which says, well, such a situation may not occur. This is a little bit of a technical uh, notion that I will not go to into more detail. So uh, now we have uh, uh, set up uh, so a programming language with its operation and semantics. So how do we uh, compute weakest preconditions? Well, it's uh, uh, calculus with Hor triples. The uh, only thing that we add so that we uh, in, in fact have quadruples and not uh, triples is a local context, a local context which tells us which uh, formulas hold for which variables. Yeah? So uh, here we will have a context saying uh, that uh, uh, capital A of uh, lowercase a holds in this, uh, at this point. This is the, the context beta that we have here. We'll see how that uh, context changes. So those are traditional rules that you know. So again, let's look at more interesting. Um, so rules, so uh, the, the rules for our uh, individual statements or elementary statements, how do they work? So I, well, propagate um, uh, a, po a post condition over the statement, so I will uh, somehow add the effect of uh, adding uh, variables V to relation R here, and how do I do that? Well, I uh, sort of substitute uh, in my post condition uh, the new relation R, so what is the new relation R if I add uh, values V to relation R? Well, uh, the new relation R somehow will contain uh, the old relation R and everything that I know about uh, the, the variables V here. So uh, the variables V may contain or may be contained free in beta. Yeah? Um, so uh, this is... Uh, how um, an update is uh, defined for individual statements. And um, so uh, in order to motivate how we, uh, well, reason about a match statement, um, so suppose that we want to delete uh, uh, the lowercase a from relation a, we look up how this uh, a has been defined here. And uh, well, we reason backwards, uh, so we we carry out this this kind of operation here by using uh, the information that is uh, known about this variable a in the context. Um, so, um, whoops. Uh, the thing that we now have to do is uh, when entering into a match statement, we somehow have to increment our context with the aid of uh, this. Uh, match guard here. Yeah. So, uh, and under this local context, we uh, do our, um, well, our reasoning locally for the substatements. Um, so, um, with this, we can carry out a traditional reasoning about validity of Hor triples. So, we say that uh, such a Hor triple is uh, valid if the execution of uh, of if any execution in a state that satisfies the precondition uh, satisfies the postcondition. This is rather traditional. Um, and um, so we can also define the weakest preconditions uh, for this calculus. Um, that is also quite natural where we have to take into account, well, uh, the additional local context beta that we have used in our hard quadruples. So I quickly want to uh, talk about the guarded fragment. So uh, the program logic that we have defined in general is valid for standard first-order logic. 
but it turns out that, well, when weakly restricting our programming language, we uh, get uh, decidable problems. So first of all, what is a guarded fragment? That's not us who, uh, or it's not we who have uh, defined that. That has been introduced uh, in the late 1990s. And it's a generalization of modal logics uh, of, of, well, what you get when translating modal logic to first-order logic. Yes, it's a decidable fragment of first-order logic, and um, while it comes in handy in our uh, application context, it often uh, can be understood as some sort of typing of variables. Yes, you can say for all clients who uh, belong to a certain class, uh, there exist uh, for example, other persons or uh, elements uh, who are in a relation. Uh, so all these uh, implicit or explicit typing constraints can be understood as guards of the underlying formula. So more formally, what is a guarded formula? Well, it's somehow a fragment of uh, first order logic. Um, and the restriction comes uh, for quantified formulas. We will just look at uh, existential quantification. So an existentially quantified formula always has to be guarded by an atomic formula. So you cannot have arbitrary formulas below an existential quantifier, but you always have to have a, a guard. And this is the same for universal quantification. Um, and um, so, um, what we will do, we will restrict, well, all the formulas that occur in our programs to guarded formulas. And um, besides, in our match statements, we'll also uh, require the formula that occurs here, the B, to be a quasi-guard, yeah, to, to be a, a conjunction of atomic formulas and uh, an arbitrary formula. So it turns out that when computing um, weakest preconditions for this kind of uh, guarded uh, statements, uh, well, we get uh, well weakest preconditions that are themselves again guarded. Yes, after some transformations, one can obtain guarded formulas. So an application of a weakest precondition calculus to a guarded program yields uh, a guarded formula, and since guarded uh, formulas or formulas of the guarded fragment are decidable, we indeed become uh, get uh, decidable proof points. Yeah. So um, just to conclude, so what have we done? We have sort of carried over traditional programming language technology into the domain of uh, databases. We have defined nested queries and updates uh, with uh, formal semantics. So we've started with an Isabel formalization, uh, linked to it is in the paper. And well, we have a uh, assertion formalism and proof extraction with uh, decidability for guarded programs. So well, this is the general setup what we are aiming at. So we intend to have a, a well, uh, an entirely formal development to extract code and uh, really uh, use that uh, code in a uh, well, formally verified uh, environment. So future work, uh, so practically we want to match our little bit artificial language to real graph uh, databases that uh, spring up recently. Uh, so this is uh, practical work to be done and theoretically we uh, want to somehow, uh, well, increment the strength of our language to include a transitive closure of relations and uh, thus to be able to reason about uh, paths in a graph. And for that, we will also need more powerful logics like fixed point logics. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions?